All right, let's get the show started. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining. Welcome to Inrhythm Lightning Talks. I'm your host, Parag Katkar. I'm the head of consulting practices at Inrhythm, and we have a lot of exciting Lightning Talks lined up for you. Our Lightning Talks are hosted every Thursday at 5.15 p.m. Eastern Time, and every week, our practice area consultants, they share their knowledge on the latest trends in the industry. And this week, uh, Nikhil Hiremath, who is a super passionate software engineer with us, uh, he's going to give us an overview of Docker containers. And as a lot of you know, Docker containers, it's an open platform for developing, shipping, and running applications. It takes away the repetitive mundane configuration tasks, and it's used throughout the development lifecycle. It helps you um, make your application development fast, easy, and portable. So I'm really excited to see what Nikhil has in store for us today. So without further ado, let's get it started, Nikhil. Thanks, Parag. And um, thanks everyone for joining this uh, session. I'm excited. I hope you're all excited to hear uh, uh, something more or uh, maybe it's something new for you um, from my side. So uh, to start with, I mean, uh, as Parag introduced, I'm Nikhil and I've been a software engineer and I've been with the organization for quite long and um, uh, mostly focused towards backend and a little bit of uh, 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 CI, CD and stuff. So out of my interests um, and my experiences, I found that um, there are some certain uh, times when the developer or the engineering teams would face a lot of challenges and hiccups when they are actually trying to uh, um, ship their applications to a different environment from the environment where they have actually um, uh, created it. So that includes um, you know, your uh, development, um, prototyping and testing, and then making that piece of software available in a different environment altogether so that uh, the product is accessible by the open world and in multiple uh, uh, environments um, and servers. So that being said, uh, this session is, I would call it as part one of the containerization technologies. Uh, the part one would basically focus on Docker as um, as uh, as one of the container uh, containerization stack which would be used eventually to be a building block for our next uh, part two um, uh, you know coming in the next uh, quarter um, which is basically focused on kubernetes so to start with uh, uh, this session i mean i would say that we are basically focused on Docker as a containerization tech, uh, which will form as a, uh, which will form as a, uh, as a, as a, as a tool to build the applications, uh, which can be uh, deployed and uh, you know uh, started, make it running on multiple environments, and be platform and platform independent or in the infrastructure agnostic. So. You must have heard about Docker um, in past. Uh, it has been there in this world for about a decade. Uh, the, 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 the fact that Docker has been uh, still in demand is only because of the fact that um, a lot of uh, engineering teams and uh, you know, uh, big tech corporations are uh, leaning more towards uh, having an open source a technology stack, which basically provides the full end-to-end -end needs of building and deploying and shipping the applications um, so that there is no vendor lock-in. Uh, you don't have to keep paying uh, the uh, uh, paying for using their environment and build your applications, uh, build your applications which are hardwired with uh, with the with the uh, with the uh, with certain cloud providers. Uh, you know, a style of uh, building the applications or uh, you know, jobs. So 
now i mean uh, what do they do i mean they actually try when they try to find certain technologies uh, docker is one such such uh, tech which will basically you know mitigate or which will fill in the gap where you can build the applications uh, in the environment which is suitable for your product and then uh, you will basically wrap it up in a in a in a in a uh, wrap it up in a in a in an image okay so i will define what's an image so that image basically holds whatever whatever it is necessary to make that application running in a certain environment or a or a remote server so th that basically introduces us to the docker and the need for it there are there are a bunch of other benefits that we see with regards to docker and uh, there are a lot of people who adapt docker for their various needs uh, which uh, i mean as time passes uh, and time permits we'll discuss that uh, so uh, that's a little bit about docker as a as a as a base technology stack towards uh, the ultimate containerization goals so that being said um, so what, what what's a container and uh, what do you mean by uh, uh, you know the container as a concept so i mean as i read as you read it on the screen i mean it's a it's a lightweight package or a bundle uh, like i said it contains everything that is necessary to spin up an application and in its given environment with its dependencies it contains the application uh, uh, applications which might be a microservice uh, it might be a front end application it might be just a tool or an executable uh, executable uh, file uh, and plus all the dependencies and tools which are required to make that uh, application uh, to bring that application in a running state and its dependencies which will help the application interact with uh, the external parties like uh, a remote server or a, or a database or a cache something of that sort so there are libraries which will help you do that so those dependencies plus the applications are basically uh, bound to an environment or a runtime environment so a java application for say will run in a jre environment a node app will run in a node environment a python needs a python runtime so those little and basic needed dependencies are all packed and bundled in a container and then you can have that uh, instance of the container running so that's basically you know container in simple words and then if you if you see if you actually look at it uh, it's not a virtual machine basically uh, a virtual machine would if you if you think of virtual machine you are basically partitioning your uh, server hardware into multiple fragments and then using every fragment uh, individually to serve a different uh, purpose in case of, so that actually takes a lot of overhead a lot of knowledge is required uh, in the hardware terms uh, meaning i mean how do you how do you uh, you know fragment your memory how do you fragment your uh, uh, your ram your cache how do you ram how do you fragment you know the processors uh, uh, cores and so on and so forth so all of that headache is involved as part of as as part of uh, you know uh, relying on a virtual machine so that is not docker uh, so it's definitely not a hardware it's a it's a software it's a piece of software that is running at the core of your um, uh, which is i mean it it's running on your operating system on top of your operating system and then uh, you can you can do everything that is needed on top of the docker layer so that is uh, a little about uh, the difference between docker and a virtual machine in general so other i mean if you want to see, if you see in the current uh, world of uh, containerization you will see certain competitors or i would not say competitors but other uh, you know parties which more or less overlap with the docker technology which more or less use docker as uh, as one of the uh, added feature or uh, or uh, uh, which i mean which provides you tools and techniques to convert your docker way of 
uh, building and shipping applications into uh, which is suitable to their environment. So one of them is um, uh, AWS, as you can see. So AWS basically has uh, uh, you know cloud formation as infrastructure as a code, uh, but the the problem is that AWS has its own syntactic uh, syntax and its own way of building the cloud formation uh, you know scripts. Uh, you cannot directly go ahead and uh, uh, you know copy your uh, your infrastructure as a code uh, and copy it in the cloud formation and have it running. So they still provide tools which will help you convert the uh, convert the Docker files, but uh, but it, it but you would eventually want to use uh, you would eventually have to use the AWS's own. Uh, you know, uh, way of writing the uh, cloud formation syntax. So that's one example of it. Uh, though, uh, though you have you 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 can also you know use Docker files or Docker Compose files uh, to um, you know to directly deploy applications in uh, different cloud platforms like PCF. Uh, PCF has recently, I mean, like in a couple of uh, in, in last couple of years, has started supporting uh, you know uh, Docker as a as a means of deploying the applications. The difference you would see with uh, against a PCF environment is that PCF is an, uh, is, is an application pass uh, where the user doesn't have any control over how the networking is happening and how the, uh, I mean, how the inter-service inter dependencies are defined as part of your deployment mechanism itself. You might you might have ways of you know connecting with other microservices deployed in the PCF, but you definitely don't have the uh, you know way to define how my how these sequence uh, how the applications are supposed to be deployed in a sequence. What are the dependencies? Uh, what is how do I uh, connect with uh, with the different storage mechanisms? So those are all the challenges that you generally see uh, with uh, with with a PCF. So those are all solved as part of Docker and, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, advanced Docker uh, technologies. So that, that work with, uh, uh, you know, uh, running the applications or containers in a clustered or a wrong clustered or a single host or multi-host environments. So that being said, let me quickly skip to the next uh, uh, slide here. So basically, uh, all that I said earlier, uh, you have a physical server, um, an operating system running on it, and then you have the Docker layer, which basically is composed of a Docker daemon and a Docker engine. So Docker daemon is the one which, ex which is basically orchestrating the commands that you are sending to a Docker application or um, uh, to the Docker engine. And Docker engine is the one which will do the actual tasks. So let's say you want to uh, pull an image from a remote registry, uh, which basically deploys uh, an application, a microservice, you would send a command uh, to the Docker uh, to the Docker client, uh, you know, using a Docker client, and Docker uh, daemon will orchestrate all the uh, commands or the instructions that you have uh, sent, and then it will instruct the Docker engine to do the rest, uh, to pull the applications or the uh, uh, the images from the Docker registry or a remote uh, hub. And then uh, you know, um, and then you know, spin spin up the applications. So while it spins up the containers, uh, there are a set of other tasks that you would want to do. Like you would want to you would want to first uh, you know spin up a MySQL server, and you would want to uh, you know define a storage space, um, and you would want to create your own network uh, where only your containers are supposed to in interact. And have everything isolated, everything else isolated. So uh, those are the tasks that were uh, that are orchestrated and executed by the Docker engine. So that being said, um, so uh, we basically more or less answered uh, uh, why do we need a Docker and how is it actually simplifying our uh, needs and necessities. Um, so that I'll just skip over to the Docker capabilities here. So docker as a whole has a has, has a has an ecosystem as an ecosystem provides you with uh, uh, multiple options to uh, to to basically define your images and uh, instruct how to spin up containers which is this part 
And then uh, you have an option to spin up volumes and attach the containers with the volumes. So what are volumes? I will define it later. Uh, but for now, you can um, it's think of it as a storage space. And then you have network. Networking is basically used for uh, connectivity. You can connect, um, you can have multiple containers in, within the same network. And uh, you can have the containers interact within the, uh, uh, interact with other containers within the network. It can, it can potentially have ways to interact with multiple other, uh, you know, um, multiple other uh, components through, you know, gateway definitions and so on and so forth. So that is about networks. So we'll discuss more about networks later. And then you have Docker uh, Compose. Compose is when you want to go with uh, multi-container uh, deployment. So that will help us, you know, re, um, you know. Um, uh, compose all the repetitive tasks in a in a set of instructions, um, and then you know uh, give one instruction to Docker uh, to uh, to spin up all the applications and bring down all the applications. So while you are actually spinning up a Docker container, uh, all the Docker containers, you do a lot of stuff. I mean, you are creating volumes, you are creating networks, you are creating so many other resources. So Docker Compose basically helps you to bring down all the all the stuff that you uh, created. At the time when you are uh, when you are uh, when you don't need them anymore, uh, so that is about Docker Compose. And then there is Hub and Registry. Uh, the Hub could be a public registry or a private registry. So every organization can have its own Docker Hub. Uh, what does it do? It basically uh, keeps. Uh, it's like the GitHub of Docker images, so or a Bitbucket of Docker images. You can have all your Docker images published in a Docker uh, uh, registry or a hub, where which manages the versioning, which manages uh, uh, the uh, the the lifecycle of the Docker images, and then you can have you can keep it for your documentation and sharing with multiple parties. So uh, again, I mean, a hub has uh, you know other uh, benefits which we'll discuss later, and then there is Swarm. Swarm is a kind of a deprecated uh, uh, you know feature. Uh, there are multiple other tech uh, technologies that are uh, uh, emerging, which will, uh, which are basically going to replace, you know, Docker Swarm. So Swarm, uh, not talking much about it. Docker Swarm is basically going to solve solve your uh, uh, clustered uh, clustering issues. Issues in the sense, uh, you can have multiple containers deployed on multiple hosts. Uh, multiple hosts, meaning multiple uh, uh, machines. And then you can have those, uh, you know, containers interact with uh, multiple uh, you know, containers on different hosts and uh, have them, uh, you know, load balance based on uh, uh, load balance and auto scale and, uh, you know, do the, uh, do the networking and other stuff. So all of this is being uh, taken care by, um, Lately, I mean, if I talk, if I if I have to talk about an open source tech, it could be you know Kubernetes, uh, which works very well, and which could uh, eventually you know um, uh, which could eventually be uh, you know a key player in uh, replacing Swarm altogether. So that being said, uh, images, right? So images are basically the blueprints or templates. So if you see here. Uh, the images would contain um, uh, the, the baseline that is required to run your application. So every every application, as I said, requires uh, something, some environment that it uh, runs on. Uh, for example, a microservice, a Java microservice, will run in a J in a Java environment. So for us to uh, uh, spin up the application, for example, a Spring Boot application. You need to have a JRE running in the uh, in the operating system, right? So for that, if you uh, on the on the right hand side at the bottom, I have uh, shown you a simple Docker file. So this should be more than enough to spin up a container. Basically, the first line indicates that you need an open JDK or uh, a JDK version eleven. So this is the base image which would be pulled from 
a remote registry um, made available by the public uh, uh, public uh, vendors or uh, individual contributors and then you you can you you declare uh, where you are going to uh, uh, where you are going to have your application uh, copied and from where you are going to you know uh, start your application so that's that is your working directory so you can copy your executables in a working directory uh, by the copy command and then after that you will have to instruct the container to uh, to let it know that uh, what is the entry point to this micro uh, to this application so there should be a way to start an application so you have to tell the container that okay if you execute this command after downloading the images and copying the executables in so on and so in, in a given directory the, execute this command to start the application so that is basically a command or an entry point uh, so generally, uh, you will uh, see the difference here, uh, which is either it could be a CMD or a command, or it could be an entry point. There, uh, both are um, both more or less do the same stuff, but entry point generally, you know, uh, gives you um, an added flexibility to to uh, to to pass the files or executable files like shell script. To, uh, which will do something more than just executing uh, the commands. So let's say if you have to do something, uh, some, some more activity before you spin up a microservice, so those activities can be declared as part of your shell script. So that shell script would be declared as an entry point here. So the last command would get replaced with the entry point in this case. So uh, going back to our uh, the, bullet, uh, the points here, the images, as you see, uh, are uh, you know are are static data. It's static because as long as the image, as long as the code and its dependencies are not running, they're all static. So the image gets uh, you know comes into life when it is started in a container. So as long as it's an as long as these images are uh, not running. They are uh, basically static. They are non-active. They are not serving any business purpose. So that's the reason images are called static, and there is no application generated data in within it because it's uh, it's not running basically. Uh, and then what happens is, I mean, every image, like you saw it from the example on the right hand side, so every image is uh, uh, you know ha has multiple instructions um, declared in a Docker file. So, uh, I mean, to to introduce you to the Docker file. No? Docker file is a is a is a text is a text document. If you if you have to imagine it, it's a text document like a Word doc or something, uh, where you are basically going to use certain uh, uh, certain set of instructions or lines to define how your image is going to be um, built, and then. At the end, you are going to, uh, you know, mention some of the additional uh, activities that are supposed to be done once your image is built. So that those all of those instructions are defined in a Docker file. So that's Docker file for you. Um, now, when you are when we are talking about these individual instructions, individual instructions are is are is going to become a layer when you are building an image so if you look if you look at the image above so the base image is an ubuntu ubuntu is an operating system so now on top of ubuntu i have to install java so when i install java on it it becomes the layer at the bottom which starts with d3 a1 f33 and when java is installed i need to you know um, i need to create a working directory so if i if, if, if maybe at the back end java might be instruct uh, you know uh, writing some commands like mkdir work in rhythm so that becomes a next instruction here uh, which uh, next layer in the image so that uh, it that's indicated by c220 so that becomes a new layer on top of it so likewise there could be multiple layers per instruction. Let's say you are defining a network or a volume. 
So that also becomes an instruction here. So there are certain layers which were uh, for, against which you are seeing zero bytes. So those are the layers which are already created, meaning that to uh, I mean every time you build an image, you don't want to keep installing you know uh, Java every single time. So if Java is already installed, then certain layers are uh, rather than rewriting it or recreating it, Java I mean Docker just decides that okay this is cached and I have it already. Let me use it as it is. So that's why you will see that 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 particular layer could have uh, could be showing only zero bytes when you are actually building a, a Docker image. So I will basically show you an example of it. Um, so, okay. So this is the Docker hub that I was talking about. So let's say I have uh, uh, this image, which I have published to the uh, Docker hub. So it, uh, uh, so the, this image is for uh, a microservice called payment data services. So now if you see, Every image, uh, uh, like I said earlier, uh, the Docker Hub provides a way of uh, versioning the images. Those versioning versions are identified by tags. So like you see at the, uh, uh, the bottom here, the V1 is the first image which was published uh, four days ago. And uh, uh, this one, the last image was the wall test. It is the, it is the one which was uh, published recently. So this way you can, um, you can, you know, you can tag your application, tag your images to clearly define that, okay, we have a version upgrade. And if you want to work on our latest image, you have to only pull the latest tag and then, uh, uh, and then you can spin up the containers based on that image. So now if you click on this image, uh, this version, you'll see that these are the image layers, right? So now if you go at the bottom, uh, if you go, uh, sorry, if you start from here, uh, there are a set of commands that, doc, that Docker executes when you are building an image. So if, uh, if you look at it, it is basically uh, setting at line, at, at layer seven, it is setting Java environment uh, uh, in a path, which is Java home. So it doesn't occupy any memory, so it is setting zero bytes against it. Let's say it has it, it is taking an update uh, to uh, to update the software. This is going to consume sixteen MB. So likewise, you when you are at the time when you are actually uh, downloading Gradle, it will take it is consuming one hundred and eighteen uh, uh, megabytes. So later on, when I upgraded this uh, this particular uh, uh, payment data services to be lightweight, I removed certain layers, right? And then, uh, which were not necessary. I didn't, I, I was not interested in installing Gradle. So eventually the size of this particular, um, you know, well image was reduced to 279 MB from like, like 400 MB or something. So much, many layers have been removed here, which were not required. Some of the, uh, some of the, uh, commands here or layers are repetitive, so uh, which were being cached, which were already being carried out in the previous uh, image building activities. So those are indicated by zero bytes, and uh, you know so on and so forth. So this is uh, uh, this is basically the size of an image. Uh, the uh, the the uh, the megabytes that you are seeing on the on the on the on the right side are basically the size of individual layers. But when you are building the images on local, you will see that those images are being cached. So coming back, uh, like I said, so if you if you want to build an image, so basically uh, this is again a different application which I have, which is called Checkout Orchestrator. It's a simple app. There is nothing much in it. It just exposes one endpoint. And if you see here, there is one endpoint which is just returning a static um, uh, HTML text here. And then there are uh, a couple of other endpoints which will fetch you the credit cards and uh, new credit cards and some cards from the file. Uh, so even if I have to build this image, I have a Docker file, uh, which is created. 
uh, for this particular application. So the working directory I've declared is checkout orchestrator. And uh, there is a copy command, which where I will copy the executables from uh, to this location. And then uh, I want this endpoint, this application or microservice to be available at the HTTP port 8081. So that's a declaration that you can make in the Docker file. Likewise, you can uh, uh, you can ignore the volume part right now, and then you have the command as described earlier. So this is more than enough to spin up and to build an image. So to just build the application, to build this image, you can just enter the command Docker build and um, say uh, give it a name like uh, with a with a hyphen t um, argument. Let's say it's a test, okay, or let's call it checkout arc with a version. Let's say checkout of v1. And here I have to enter dot so that it has to work on the current context route. So if you see here, so there are multiple activities that are happening as part of this uh, as part of this instruction. So uh, a lot of uh, layers are imported, a lot of layers are executed, and then um, you are basically uh, you know spinning up the uh, sorry uh, you are basically building the images with all of these layers um, in the in the in the final image that gets created. So this is much about Docker build right now. I would like to. Uh, go further and then talk about Docker containers. So Docker container is a running version of a Docker image. And then uh, every Docker image can be executed um, uh, with reference to a Docker, uh, uh, with uh, sorry, every Docker container would use a Docker image to create a runtime of that particular Docker image. So if you have to, if you have to run this image that we execute that we created just now, you just have to execute a Docker run command, and then you have to just give the reference. You, if you want to give a name to it, um, uh, let's say checkout orc app, and then you just have to mention the image at the end. So this should be more than enough. If you have to expose a port, you can declare a you can map the port uh, that is within the container and map the port on the host side to be connected to the port that is running within the container. So you will see you will see more of it later when you run the application. So this is basically this is a little required to run the container. Although this application. Uh, is not starting because uh, I have to set a environment variable like a server port. So I can give, I can pass a server, I can set a server port here with an E, uh, with an E argument, dash E argument. So this should be like 881. And this should be, I mean, this will basically spin up a, uh, a Docker, uh, uh, I would say that it should basically spin up a uh, Spring application within a container so so that is uh, so we, i will basically you know show you the uh, fully running container later as we as we go as we go uh, further um, we spoke about docker hub so docker hub is basically uh, as i showed you image uh, it, it maintains the images image versions and the image layers all together so again uh, we spoke about Docker Hub earlier, and then, then we are here at the volumes and the mounts section. What are volumes? Volumes are basically a storage offering by the uh, Docker technologies. Uh, volumes basically can be uh, either within the container or volumes can be uh, sitting outside of the container, which could be uh, the host machine. So let's say you have a server, and you your server uh, you want to you know uh, you want to keep your logs uh, copied into this uh, into a remote server where you want to investigate the logs later. That is when you would use 
the bind mounts, which are a different, uh, you know, um, flavor of volumes. So those will be useful for you to, you know, either uh, look at, uh, either uh, 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 copy the logs or uh, stream the logs so, and, you know, have them used for audit or what, whatsoever. But in case of volumes, you can, volumes are directly attached with the containers. Uh, and then, you know, its life cycle is managed by the container. You, since its life cycle is managed by the containers, you don't know where the location of the volumes, volume is uh, because the volumes are residing within the containers, uh, within the Docker, uh, uh, within the Docker's uh, you know, kernel. Uh, that being said, uh, what are the two offerings that they are giving as part of uh, you know, volumes? So you have named volumes and you have anonymous volumes. You know? So there is a slight difference between in each of these uh, you know, in case of anonymous volumes, the life cycle is still attached with the containers, uh, and uh, say meaning that I mean, if you if you spin a container, if you start a container, the volume is created with it, and when you shut down a container, the volume is deleted with it. So you can, if you if you spin a new container with the same image that uh, that was used in spinning up a container earlier you will not get the data back so the data retention is not possible in case of a in case of the uh, in case of uh, anonymous volumes so uh, and then generally i mean the uses of uh, the uh, anonymous volumes are uh, when you want to you know have your executable files uh, protected and not modified by uh, anyone uh, you would want to use anonymous volumes because uh, when a container is down, the file is deleted. When a container is running, the uh, the anonymous volumes, the files inside the anonymous volumes are protected. So th that is mostly the use cases, uh, uh, the use case of an anonymous volume. Or you can also use anonymous volumes for uh, for maintaining the uh, the data on flight, which is maybe uh, for caching and other purposes. And then you have named volumes. Name volumes are something uh, which are which are uh, uh, which are shared between multiple containers. Let's say you have uh, you have you have spinned up a container. Uh, though the lifecycle is still attached with a container, when you are going to spin up a container two with the same image, that data can be accessed by the uh, the container two. So the container one created a named volume copied some files into it, then your container two can, when it spins up, it can use the, uh, you can, it can still access the data that is residing in the named volume that was, which was created by the container one. So that's basically the, uh, the uh, scope and the use of uh, named volumes. There might be different use cases like the logs and temporary data uh, that is shared between multiple, uh, uh, between multiple containers. Let's say you are load balancing yourself you are uh, sorry, auto scaling and load balancing your uh, applications. So you need the data to be shared uh, between the containers. Let's say you have payment data services one and instance two. So both the instances are working on same credit card or a card. Then uh, you, if you have saved that card on file somewhere in the in the in name volume, so both the containers needs needs to have the access to that particular file so that they serve the, uh, the, the, the so that the data that they are returning it is item coded. So that is uh, about name volumes. So we spoke about bind mount. Bind mount is uh, for so is own is basically used for um, uh, is not is basically used in the development environments. It's not it has very less scope in production environments because uh, you don't you don't you don't change the data when it is actually when your containers are actually running. Uh, you don't uh, you don't copy the files from your host machine into the into a running container remotely uh, so that those are not ideal use cases uh, i this more or less you know bind mounts are used for uh, you know, log sharing if you in a development environment if you want to hot swap the source code you can do that with bind mounts and so on and so forth so that is much about bind mounts okay so these are the, uh, I mean, if you have to create a, an anonymous volume, you have to just uh, either, um, you can do it through the Docker file, like I, like I showed it to you earlier, 
um, this is an anonymous volume, okay, where you are executable files. So this file, uh, the, the executable jar, which we copied it into the checkout orchestrator lib directory will be protected as part of this anonymous volume, right? And either, or you can basically declare it along with your VM arguments uh, when you are uh, running a Docker container. So, sorry, uh, with the dash V command. So, and then you have name volumes. Name volumes, again, uh, you can still uh, declare them in the uh, Docker file, but the only difference is that you have uh, a prefix to the, uh, to the, uh, to the path of the volumes location. So here logs, a colon slash backend app slash logs uh, would would actually you know create a name volume for you out of box. There, when you actually build an image, uh, when you run the container, it will not prompt you to uh, decide whether it's a name volume or an anonymous. Uh, if it sees that it is prefixed with a name and a colon or a string and a colon, it will decide that this is a name volume and then it is created. So likewise, uh, the VM argument looks synonymous. So this is uh, this is much about it. And again, in case of bind mounts, since there it ensures that the data is retained and shared across applications and uh, it is accessible, uh, you have to give the full class path of the uh, of the of the of the directory which you are indicating that is going to be a bind mount. In this case. Since uh, uh, I mean, if you if you have to do it, you have to mention um, uh, you know full class path users you know your uh, your 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 machine name and then your complete directory path where the where you have created a a file or a folder which is directly mapped to uh, a volume in the inside the Docker container. So. So in I mean uh, that is uh, that is little that you need to know about bind mounts. I mean there's a lot of other configuration that you can do around uh, the volumes, uh, read write read only mode and so on and so forth. But uh, for the introductory part, this should be good in. So then I mean networking as we spoke earlier, uh, uh, networking in Docker is basically to either have communication between the containers or between containers and multiple hosts or between the container and the outside or World Wide Web. This happens through uh, the multiple uh, you know, gateway offerings that Docker engine has. So uh, these gateways are uh, built on, I mean, they exploit the different connection types that Docker provides. So these connection types uh, very commonly used is bridge, uh, which is the which is the first and foremost here. Bridge is something which is uh, which provides your basic network isolation between the containers, or it can group a bunch of containers and have only those containers in a bridge interact with each other. So that if you are let's say you are running a container one with uh, with a port eighty eighty and you have a container two within the same bridge network and which is also running on port 880, then the Docker will not let it happen because there will be a problem to map the, uh, the, the machine support, the actual hardware support 880 with the, uh, with the, with the, with the Docker, uh, with the bridges support 880 because two multiple containers are going to run on 880, then uh, there will be a port conflict. So that will that is basically taken care by the bridge network. There, are, uh, other than that, uh, there are other uh, you know uh, network types, connection types, uh, which uh, which is like overlay. Overlay has its most importance when you are running on when you are running the Docker containers in a clustered mode. So clustered in the sense you have uh, you have you have your hardware you have uh, uh, you have multiple uh, uh, you know networks uh, created within the uh, within the within the hardware and then uh, those individual network are basically going to interact with each other okay or with the external world or 
you have machine one and machine two, uh, which in this case, they are multi-host. So the host itself is uh, two, are two different computers or two different servers. In that case, you bridge cannot bridge cannot uh, bridge has no scope of talking to an external uh, party because it can only talk it can only uh, org organize the communication between the containers uh, within within a given uh, within a given uh, you know subnet or within a within a given uh, private network i would say so in that case net overlays have a greater importance when you have to talk to the world wide web or you have to in, in uh, establish a connection between multi-host environment or or a, or a cluster clusters that are running in multiple hosts and then you have uh, vlans uh, not much of a in, in uh, use for a develop for day-to-day uh, -day activities in a developer world because you don't modify your mac and ip addresses uh, to you know stall, to solve uh, you know uh, any business problems so they have a different use case altogether we can skip it and then um, host is again uh, uh, it has its capabilities are same as bridge the only difference is that you can directly talk to the host machine a container which is running on top of docker engine uh, basically is isolated with a bridge network if you have to if you want to exploit all the capabilities of the host machine then you uh, or the network capabilities of the host machine then you can create a connection type which is uh, or a network which is of type host, and then have your container applications running within the container or the container exploit the capabilities of the host uh, network cards, basically. Uh, so that is much about it. I mean, if you uh, basically want to have your, uh, if you say, let's say you, are, you have installed uh, a MySQL on your host machine and you have uh, a server or a, or a checkout application, which is, which is running in a container, Docker container. And if you want to, you know, uh, connect to the MySQL on the host machine, then your host URL in your MySQL or JDBC connections would be host.docker.internal. Because, because doc, because container is running in its own network, so there's definitely a way to connect to the uh, uh, to the MySQL running on the host. So uh, you just have to change the uh, this thing, uh, the host. Uh, uh, host URL to doc host or docker dot internal. So that's that's one example of connecting with the host machines. So and then you have uh, different ways of uh, you know publishing ports and mapping the host port with the client port uh, by you know passing the VM arguments, which is shown at the bottom uh, right of the slide. So if you when you are running a when you are running a container, if you pass uh, if you if you want to map your host port 8080 with the container port 8080, then you just have to pass it with, uh, you have to run the container with an additional argument dash P. So as simple as that. So quickly going towards, uh, you know, Docker Compose. So, you know, why do we, uh, why do we need a Docker Compose basically? So let's say I have uh, three applications here, like I was showing it to you earlier. Uh, we have three applications here, right? And uh, these, sorry, uh, okay. There are two microservices and one database server. Okay, that makes us three applications. So one is a front end orchestrator. Okay, so front end orchestrator is going to, uh, you know, uh, take the request for uh, a card API or a new card API, and then it's going to make a call to the. Uh, uh, to the downstream through a service called cards handler uh, and in this case the downstream is a is a different container which is payment data services in this case right and payment data services is again a different microservice which is a, which is a spring boot application and in this case payment data services also exposes an endpoint which is uh, cards slash name so what it does is payment data services basically uh, makes a call uh, to the to to the external faker api which is a public endpoint to to fetch some, some random you know, cards credit cards so i'm making a call which is outbound call from a container to the internet gateway to the faker api which will fetch you like five cards uh, at a given at a time and then 
you are going to fetch it and then save it in the MySQL database through our repository interface. And then, uh, you know, if you want, you can basically go through the uh, you know, get, get cards API. So the get cards would basically fetch the cards for you and then return the cards that are saved in the uh, in the database that we uh, earlier spoke about. So now, if I have to make all of these three applications working, then I have to spin these components individually. I have to execute Docker run commands every single time. Like you saw it here, I was, uh, I'm running this command. So I'm facing some problem uh, when I'm trying to expose a server port, right? So I can basically solve this problem uh, by just you know, providing it a right command to to uh, to run uh, to run with a uh, with an extra argument. Okay, so here if I run this one, it will definitely start uh, uh, st st start the application, right? Uh, but the problem would be that it will. I have to change the app name here so that it will start, right? Okay, so. Here it starts the checkout application, right? So now if I go ahead and refresh, uh, if I go ahead and access the endpoint here, let's say localhost 8081 and test. So it should render me the, the simple HTML, right? This, call, this, is, this response is coming from a front-end container, which is called a checkout orchestrator, right? If I have to make a call to the, to fetch credit cards so it gives me an error because we have we don't have our dependency yet deployed this app as i said is going to contact or connect with the payment uh, payment data services right checkout orchestrator will make a call to the payment data services which will fetch the sorry which will fetch the uh sorry, okay which will fetch the uh, cards from a remote uh, fake APIs, and then it will save it in database, and then it returns. In this case, our service is, uh, I mean, not deployed. So what I have to do? Again, come back. Okay. Then um, okay, let me go to your checkout. Same thing. Docker run. Okay. And then port. I have to expose the uh, host port. Map it with the container port, and then um, give it. Give a you know, declare a server port right and then indicate it like this so on and so forth and give it a name here okay payment data okay payment data services give me give it a short name for save time and then uh, then you will have to you know basically uh, you know use the use one of these uh, uh, images that i've already created here right so let me use this one so for test so this will spin up a backend server for me, okay? And, and then it is expecting some additional URLs like the MySQL URL and so on and so forth. So every time I'm going to spin up this application, it is I have to I have to take care of you know passing the environment arguments like MySQL URL. I have to expose a port. I have to uh, use correct images, uh, image references, and, and so on. I don't want to do that because I have to save my time. I have to deploy three applications with a database dependency in just one command. This is where the importance of a Docker Compose comes into picture. If you look at the Docker Compose file, it you can declare all the services uh, that are required to be uh, to be uh, to be spun up. So the first one in the uh, here is a MySQL server. I'm calling it a MySQL server. Uh, it has to use a base image, which is MySQL image. If this MySQL image is present on my local Docker cache, it will use the same image. Otherwise, it will fetch this open source MySQL image from the Docker public registry. And then you can pass your uh, uh, the, the, the uh, MySQL credentials, which is the user, password, and the uh, the database name if i have to pass any if i want this card repository to be created up front i will just say okay create just create card repository uh, when you, whenever the mysql is spinning up so that being said the next one is payment data services again 
everything that we declared in a Docker file, uh, uh, which is our context root, uh, where is the Docker file, the working directory, uh, the image name, and with a tag uh, that is versioning, the port that are supposed to be mapped, and then there is a dependency here. So if the payment data services can only spin up once the container MySQL is available, then it can be declared this way with a depends on uh, configuration. Similarly, you have the checkout orchestrator uh, application, which is a front end. So this is depending on the payment data services. So that's how we are uh, you know, chaining the application deployment here. So this is a very simple uh, Docker Compose file. Uh, and then, I mean, if you, if you can configure it uh, as much as you want and make it more uh, uh, you know, healthy, uh, and I mean, ensure that you, all the applications when they come up are healthy and only then spin up the next dependency and so on and so forth. So that you can do it with the, uh, by declaring the policies and so on. So here, if you see, uh, there is a Docker Compose file where I'm declaring a health check, right? On the MySQL, once MySQL is ready, uh, this health check uh, would be executed. And then I'm creating a network uh, called checkout suite manual. And then uh, the alias, I will talk about alias later because um, uh, <laughs> we are left with less time. And then uh, payment data services uh, has a dependency on volumes. Here we have declared a bind mount to copy the logs into the audit directory, right? And then uh, if you see the deployment has a dependency here where the payment data services is going to be restarted and attempted to restart three times if it fails to start, right? That's as simple as it says. Uh, and then uh, you can declare a health check here. Um, uh, so you, I, have, I have a health test endpoint which can be used for a health check, health of, to check the health of this particular application. Like we were passing the server port in an argument, here you can pass, you can pass the environment variables through uh, the environment files. So all I have in this environment file is, is just the server code declared. So all you can just pass those uh, as part of a Docker Compose definition itself, right? So that's, uh, th so that is how, uh, that is how the checkout orchestrator is also defined, uh, very, very much similar to the payment data services that I defined earlier. So, and then, um, you have network definition. Like if you have to create a network, Docker by default creates checkout suite manual network as a bridge network. And all of these services that are declared in this Docker file are going to be attached to the, uh, attached to this network by default. If I don't explicitly mention a network uh, here, right? In the, let's say at line number 51, if I change it to one, then it will be it will be associated with a different network. Otherwise, all of these will be associated with the uh, with this uh, network that is defined at line number seventy one. So similarly, you have volumes that you can explicitly create and uh, as part of the Docker Compose. And you know, there you go. Uh, we can talk more about it, but let's just uh, you know, uh, spin up the. Uh, uh, let's just run this uh, Docker Compose file and see that it's working as expected. Docker, uh, to spin up all of these applications at once, all you can do is to just execute one command, Docker Compose up. That's it. So here, I mean, I change something here. Let me... Fix it. Okay. So just okay. Let me just go to these lightweight containers and that should be okay. So this should be good. Okay. So if you see here, um, it's basically pulling the checkout orchestrator image, right? And then Sim at parallel, it is pulling the payment data services image. So since these images already exist 
on my machine, it says it already exists and, and, and proceeds with the next step. So likewise, it is creating a network like instructed in the, in the, uh, in the Docker Compose. And then uh, the network is created. This network, which is created by the Docker Compose is connect, uh, is used to, uh, to associate with the MySQL and the payment data services and the checkout orchestration uh, components like this. So, so that is um, uh, basically, you know, Docker Compose. Okay, so with this, uh, I, uh, we can see that Docker Compose is uh, fairly simple to deploy a multi-container application, and uh, all the all the components can be deployed at once with just one command, which is Docker Compose up, and we can also bring down all the services and networks with just one command. So that is Docker Compose. Um, I think let's wrap up. This has been really thorough, uh, though. So um, thank, you. thank you. We'll have this, you know, uh, this part on deploying on AWS and uh, Kubernetes together covered as part of our next session, which is containerization part two. And uh, there uh, I will briefly describe how to deploy a multi-container application on EC2 instance. And then we can use the AWS's, uh, 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 AWS's managed containerized so containerization service, which is called Elastic Container Services, to uh, uh, to deploy the applications, but it's a paid service. Uh, and then you can also uh, we can also look at the Elastic uh, you know Kubernetes services, which is again a managed service for deploying Kubernetes pods, uh, which um, with the help of you know Docker uh, as a as a as a base for our uh, of our technical stack. Thanks again, uh, Nikhil. And as a reminder to all of you, we do these lightning talks every Thursday at uh, 5.15 p.m. Eastern. And next week, Veda Vyas Prabhu, who is a senior SDET with us, is going to give us an overview of Apply Tools. Apply Tools is a next generation test automation platform that's powered by visual AI. And Vyas will explain how to increase the quality as well as accelerate the delivery and reduce the cost uh, using uh, this tool. I'm looking forward to this talk. So make sure you all mark your calendar for next week. And thank you once again for joining. Have a wonderful evening and I'll see you all next week.